much appreciation to everyone who uh, has come today. And uh, of course, Kat and her colleagues for the uh, opportunity to speak. So I'm going to be talking about um, education training in biology and medicine. Um, and you'll, I'm going to start with a fair exploration of, of the issues um, concerning animal experimentation and alternatives or non-animal methods. Um, and then look at how the different areas of education and, uh, and then focus on education regarding students. So ethics, innovation and replacement in biology and medical training. And I should be able to go forward. Here we are. So just a few tastes of uh, alternatives. Um, some virtual laboratory here within physiology. Um, some surgery alternatives. So this particular one actually is a canine surgery model, but there are very similar ones within human medicine, of course, as well. And apprenticeship, observing, assisting and performing operations um, valuable for not only veterinary medicine, but of course, medicine too within the apprenticeship model. So these are all alternatives, uh, replacement alternatives to animal experimentation or the dissection of purpose killed animals. So we'll start off first with looking at the context and some definitions. We have animal experimentation and other harmful animal use in a number of different fields. First, education and training, which is what uh, we'll be talking about today, research and testing. But there's quite a few differences between the education and training on one hand and the pure and applied science on the, the other. Firstly, it's not research. It's not the acquisition of new knowledge. Rather, it is acquiring known knowledge. Secondly, it's not testing of drugs and chemicals for regulatory purposes. It's about skills and knowledge acquisition. But it's important, I think, to recognize that humane education and training is a prerequisite for humane science, for humane research and humane testing. Um, so it's very important, I think, despite the lower number of animals used within education compared to science, um, to recognize the importance and the role of it. Um, not only the preparation of those future scientists if they go into science, um, but also looking at how there is a lot of commonality between the fields, um, particularly in terms of um, quality of training and quality of practice. Um, so uh, we'll be exploring that a little bit during the talk. Um, there's also a number of different areas of education and training, which I'm gonna um, talk about first. So number one is education of students and the general public about alternatives. And this happens primarily about research and testing. So this is the first field where we can talk about education. This doesn't bring about direct replacement. Um, it's more of an informational um, aspect. The second is the training of scientists, technicians, assessors, and others in the use of alternatives for application within research and testing. This may bring about replacement in the immediate or um, medium future, and it, but it's more of a scientific and technical issue. The third area, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, is the education and training of students and trainees through the use of alternatives within secondary, higher, and professional levels in order to gain knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So we're not talking about um, education about alternatives. We're not talking about research and testing. We're talking about how students gain and trainees gain knowledge and skills and what tools do they use. This again is an area where replacement can be achieved and it's more of a pedagogical and technical uh, area. There's also the special case of uh, training uh, various individuals and groups through the use of alternatives in order to gain skills for laboratory animal use within research and testing. And of course, this replacement can bring about um, uh, implementation that uh, ends animal use within some degree of that training, but the animal experiments may well continue within research and testing. So there's a special area there. It's not an area that we particularly focus on. Um, we we would uh, 
be happy for students to graduate and go into becoming, if there were uh, students of medicine, of veterinary medicine, more in, within the clinical field and within humane science. Um, but there is an area here where replacement can be achieved within the education and training aspect, even if people are continuing to go on to animal experimentation in the future um, for the time being while that while that lasts. So if we look at the education and training of students and trainees through the use of alternatives, we can break down that educational um, field. So we have the different levels. And then within higher education, primarily we're talking about veterinary, medical and biology faculties. There are other areas, dentistry, occasionally psychology, where animals might be used harmfully and alternatives or non-animal methods could be introduced. But primarily, we're talking about these three faculties. And within these, we have the different disciplines, anatomy, pathology, physiology, pharmacology, clinical skills and surgery, for example. Um, and those are the main areas. Within biology, of course, we're talking more about anatomy and, and um, uh, physiology. Uh, within veterinary and medical, um, we also have the clinical skills and surgery areas. There's some degree of crossover as well. Some biologists might go into um, wildlife um, biology. And, and of course, there are some, some uh, uh, common areas there with the veterinary field. So it's important, I think, to recognize there is opportunities for crossover there. Um, and also to look at some of the tools that have been developed, which can be used in um, more than one area, or at least can inspire people perhaps to develop some of their own tools in a different area, which is why we've got quite a wide range of tools within our listed within our alternatives database, the free access, one of the free access databases um, on our website. Then within each of these disciplines, of course, we have the practical classes or more at the professional level, the training events. Uh, and this is where animals or non-animal methods um, will be implemented. And there's a choice here. Um, I will be explaining a little bit more um, shortly about uh, um, the definition of alternatives because there is some replacement possible when we look at, when we focus on harmful animal use and its replacement. And that doesn't necessarily mean a non-animal method is the most suitable. It could also involve animals, but in a way that doesn't cause any individual harm or could actually benefit those individual animals. So we're talking about effective acquisition of knowledge, skills, and attitudes um, by students and trainees. And it's a matter of the design of the curriculum and which tools are used for teaching and learning within those practical classes and training courses. The majority of conventional harmful use, but not all, has been harmful. Um, and this may comprise dissection of animals killed for the purpose um, of that dissection anatomy lab. It might be animal experimentation itself, and it might also be other instrumental animal use, which doesn't fit into either of the um, former two categories. There are, of course, some humane traditions by country, by discipline, by practical class. Certainly veterinary surgery in the UK is generally learned within the clinics, within with animal patients rather than with animal experimentation. That's increasingly the case in some other countries. Um, and... Uh, I think really that you have to look at every individual practical class, discipline or country to see what the difference of choices and traditions are. But not everything is about changing a bad situation to a good situation. And there are also humane traditions, which I think are important to recognize, to validate um, and, uh, and to, to lift. And of course, they can also be further enhanced, um, even if a tool um, could bring about replacement it can also enhance a situation that is already humane, but for which additional teaching objectives could be uh, met through the introduction of a tool that is informed by new developments in technology, new materials, science approaches, and so on. So uh, recognize this, and uh, um, I think this also helps in our definition of the word alternative, which we'll look at shortly. There's also a lot of replacements continuing at the moment, I think, and progress towards humane education. Um, much 
really began, I think, from the late 80s when there was a growing environmental and animal protection movement um, across the world, certainly within Europe um, and uh, North America, but also elsewhere. Um, and um, from the early 90s onwards, uh, of course, the development of a lot of excellent computer software and hardware, or maybe not so excellent at first, but still useful and valuable. Um, and then increasingly very, very powerful and bringing all the bringing many, many new opportunities to the learning process, things that could not be done before um, with objectives that can be teaching objectives that can be met more easily and um, and with with associated additional objectives. So technology really played a major part, I think, in that and change. Um, and there was often 50 percent, 100 percent replacement within individual classes, really, from the early 90s onwards. Um, and that's a continuing process. Um, and I think recent technology has enhanced that even more. So what is humane education and training? We define it as an effective education and training where curricular design enables teaching objectives to be met using humane alternative methods. It's also um, where animals are free from harm and students and trainees have freedom of conscience. And where we can help develop the qualities and the skills of critical thinking, emotional literacy and ethical literacy, and a sense of personal, social, cultural responsibility as well. We need to define harm if we're looking at replacement of harmful animal use. And this is how we define it. Any action, deliberate or otherwise, that impinges on an animal's current or future well-being by denying or limiting any of the following freedoms, the freedom to live, the freedom to express full natural behavior, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, and other freedoms that we detail within our policy. We're also updating the policy this year um, to include some other areas and to clarify some, some points, um, but the full definition of what the freedoms we believe animals should be um, um, able to continue having are detailed within that policy. Um, whoops, sorry, we're a little glitch there with the um, PowerPoint. But the issues are not only within the practical class. Um, they are issues within the capture. Sometimes animals are caught, such as frogs, from the wild and taken, affecting local ecosystems, um, and, and of course, leading to the, the killing of the frogs. In the breeding of animals, in the transportation of those animals, in the caging and the keeping of those animals, within the experimentation and the killing itself, the preservation and also disposal. So here we have broader animal welfare and ecological impacts, which can be negative and usually are negative. Um, so I think that we have to look at a broader picture, look at the whole life cycle from where the animal is sourced or bred um, up until disposal. And when we look at the full picture, we can see certainly it's beyond the harm caused immediately before and during the practical class, um, but happens from capture and breeding right up to the disposal element. And you'll notice that, that we've included death as a significant form of harm. Um, it may be quick, it may be so-called humane, but it's still a form of harm in itself. The animal can no longer is no longer alive, can no longer enjoy life, has no more familial and social and ecological connections. Um, and that is a serious loss. It also loses its or his or her potential for joy, for happiness, for procreation, for play, and so on. So all of these, I think, are very significant, and we need to count death as a significant form of harm. If an animal is killed, of course, it's um, and used before killed before a, procedure, a, a practical class that may not be listed with as a procedure um, by law. So, so there's a, a shortcoming there in terms of legislation um, because we, we do believe that death is a significant form of harm. What about the issue of teaching about ethics, about alternatives, about animal welfare? Um, if that is happening alongside harmful animal use, such as animal experimentation. We think this is an inconsistent approach. Um, and the lessons 
about ethics, animal welfare and uh, alternatives, um, risk being negated by that harmful animal use. So a joined up approach, I think, is really, really important to make sure that um, the education is thorough, comprehensive and consistent. When replacement alternatives are used within education training, that's a significant aspect of that education about ethics, animal welfare and alternatives put into practice. So I think it's very important to see the applied element of the lessons um, that students may be taught as well. So we, really we need to sort of make sure that such lessons are in parallel with replacement of harmful animal use and the implementation of fully humane methods. We also of course need to look at the three R's um, how useful or helpful are the three R's of replacement, reduction and refinement for education and training? And indeed, how relevant are they? They come, of course, from a laboratory animal science perspective, not a pedagogical one. So we would argue that there's limited relevance for education and training. Of course, replacement is still prioritised within the three R's. Uh, Russell and Birch were clear on that, um, and it is the objective. So when that can be achieved, it should be achieved. We would redefine the three R's when it comes to education and training. Firstly, to make them stricter, because full replacement is feasible within education and training, and, and departments across um, all the areas, all faculties um, that use alternatives only um, illustrate the feasibility of this. So first, the more strict by arguing for one R, not three R's within education and training. Secondly, making them smarter. There are replacement solutions that may involve animals. They're still fully humane, but they cause zero additional harm. And we'll talk about uh, clinical learning opportunities, but also ethic, the use of ethically sourced animal cadavers um, shortly. Um, but this, this perhaps um, makes a smarter definition of the three R's or of alternatives when it comes to uh, education and training. Last, perhaps we can consider retirement for the three R's and instead focused on enhanced education and training. I think it's important also to recognise that we have um, some myths that we may consciously or unconsciously be subscribing to. And of course, a myth is something that isn't always conscious. So I think it's important to identify these and to clarify them. One myth is that animal experimentation is somehow the real thing. We can see when it comes to comparative studies, when it comes to the arguments for replacement, a lot of the arguments against that will be, well, these alternatives aren't the real thing, um, or they're just uh, mediocre approximations to the real thing. But I think there's a there's a mistake there. That is a myth. And if I, if we if people are arguing that alternatives are not the real thing, and that animal experimentation or other harmful animal use is, I think we need to clarify this. I think this confuses the method with the objective within a practical class, for example. Animal experimentation is just one method, but the real thing is effective gaining of knowledge, skills, and positive attitudes. So when we focus on what we're actually really trying to achieve, which is um, being informed and being competent as a, as a graduate, um, then I think we can, we can instead look at what are the different tools that can help meet that. And we move away from this attachment to animal experimentation um, with this, this myth that it's the real thing. It's not the real thing. It, often these were not validated themselves, but when we focus on knowledge and skills acquisition, then we can choose tools that are better for that process. So our focus as Interniche is to achieve, help achieve full replacement of harmful animal use and implement the alternatives. It's a matter of curricular design, of defining teaching objectives and choosing methods that can enhance the acquisition of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. The second part of the presentation now will be looking at the different types of alternative 
um, that are being developed, that have been developed and are being implemented um, across the world. We can define alternatives as tools and approaches that replace harmful animal use and meet teaching objectives. And in many departments, these are now the norm. It's important, I think, to recognize this. The word alternatives is very useful sometimes to help bring about some change. But in fact, for many teachers, these are just standard, normal and better ways of teaching and for students to learn. We can recognize that there are both non-animal tools and fully humane approaches uh, that do involve animals, that, but that are neutral or beneficial to those individual animals. And there are many different types of alternative. First, film and video. Models, mannequins and simulators. Computer simulation and virtual reality. Ethically sourced cadavers, organs and tissues, both human and animal. Clinical work with patients, human and animal. Student self-experimentation. Non-invasive. I should add, in vitro laboratories and ethical field studies. And we're going to have a look at each of these different types with some examples now. So the first, of course, is the, the standard film of, for example, a dissection. And these are usually professionally performed um, dissections. Um, they may or may not be um, performed on animals that were um, ethically sourced. Um, or naturally died, who naturally died, for example, they may involve killing as well. However, um, that is a historical act, and we now have a product, um, and new products can also be made more ethically as well. So the production of alternatives is a, an ethical issue to consider. But there are many different films, of course, digi mostly digitized now, uh, or produced digitally, which can often impart more knowledge to the students or the trainee than a dissection performed by the student in the, with a stressful situation, limited access to the animal, um, the animal bodies, um, and with often the the ethical issues not really being addressed properly. Um, and when we're talking about late teenagers, early 20 stu 20s students, we're talking about people whose uh, often whose moral position is not fully developed or clarified yet. Um, and I think it's a very important to be very open about animal use. And certainly when um, animals are ethically sourced, as we'll talk about shortly, or where a non-animal tool such as a film, a video is used, and that can be discussed openly and ethical issues can be resolved. So I think the learning environment is much better using the alternatives, using the non-animal methods. Um, and film like this has been used, of course, for many, many decades um, and has been a, a good tool to help teach anatomy. And often, as is the case with many alternatives, is in common, used in combination with other tools as well. Um, for example, a film of a frog dissection could be combined with an ethical field study of biology students, zoology students going out and looking at animals in the wild, looking at animal behavior, um, looking at um, external anatomy um, and combined also with software, which we'll talk about shortly, you have three different methods Now, typically, of course, within education training, there are multiple tools used. So um, it may be the case that a single alternative can directly replace the dissection of a purpose killed animal or an animal experiment. And that's fine. But often it's the question of, of uh, meeting more teaching objectives and using multiple methods to bring the advantages from each method um, to hand. So a film, a video, for example, is not hands-on. That's sufficient for most students, but for many um, or for some, the, uh, the hands-on aspect is very important. So we have to look at how the hands-on aspect can be met too. So that's film and video. Models, mannequins and simulators is a very large area. There are a lot of different um, approach tools within this, this field. Uh, models, of course, have been used for hundreds of years, if not uh, even more, um, to help illustrate anatomy and pathology. Here we have uh, a gentleman with a, um, a, uh, a human body model. 
um, from the uh, probably mid to late 19th century. So you can see that these tools have been used for teaching, for helping teaching um, for, for a very, very long time. Different materials, of course, now can allow for a number of different, um, bring a number of different advantages. Um, within zoology, there are wood and plastic and silicone tools, um, labels like this starfish here. Often you can take them apart. You can do a sort of uh, dissection, as it were, um, in order to, to understand the difference of spatial elements concerning different organs and organ systems. Um, and such models, again, have been used for a very long time. They're standard teaching methods, but they can also bring about direct replacement for um, of killing for dissection. Um, so I won't go any more into, into models. There's a huge amount available. Um, you can also look at uh, producers and individual tools within our alternatives database. Um, 3D printing, of course, um, is a, a, a relatively new approach and a lot of different anatomy models can now be 3D printed. In many universities have 3D printers. And it's a question now, I think, of, of local production of alternatives also can overcome some of the other issues, such as purchase costs and shipping costs of um, tools developed by companies or other universities. Um, sharing, of course, is, is very good. Uh, sometimes it's really not worth reinventing the wheel. Um, but if you want to have um, local production, if you want to have something that's specific to your curriculum, uh, despite the commonality across the world of most disciplines and, uh, and faculties, um, there are some different elements like certain species that might be taught about within um, tropical countries compared to more temperate. So 3D printing can be a very important uh, um, tool for that. On the left here, you can see a, a suture pad. Um, there's an opportunity there for putting colored water in so you can have a bleeding uh, pad when you um, incise it. Um, and you can also 3D print such tools or they can be used um, produced in a standard way um, by using the different silicones and rubbers and so on that are in polymers that can be um, so valuable for such, an, such a, um, a production. We also have uh, within human medicine a very, very wide range of, uh, of models and mannequins. Um, there's a lot and a lot more money available in human medicine than veterinary medicine, for example. There are some excellent tools within veterinary medicine that I'll be talking about in my other talk. Um, in a few weeks, but uh, within human medicine, there's some really stunning uh, tools, um, both for um, helping to understand anatomy, um, but also for some, some physiology and pharmacology elements, um, emergency care, trauma management, um, critical care, and so on. Um, you can see here a, the, uh, a part built uh, mannequin developed by Sindava, the uh, biotech company from Florida. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about their canine model for abdominal surgery in my next talk. Um, but this is the human model. You can see on the left, um, uh, one of the models and on the right, a different model um, with that's focusing more on the, the musculature and the um, uh, vasculature and so on. Um, so two different, very good models within, within human medicine. Um, and such tools, of course, are, are really, really important for the medical student. Um, unlike veterinary, where, where students are expected to be highly skilled right upon graduation, in medicine, there are many different levels, of course, with internship and residency. Um, and um, that specialization that can uh, that's associated with that. So there are many different tools available for many different levels and areas. Um, but I think... Uh, um, when it comes to using human cadavers, uh, there's been a lot of uh, ending of preserved human cadavers within um, the medical field. Some people don't consider that to be a good idea, but of course you have a situation where um, human tissue changes a lot in terms of color and texture. Um, and we have the issue of formaldehyde and health and safety issues that have brought about an ending to a lot of dissection of human and animal um, calibers for for reasons of safety for both students and staff um but still there are some uses i think for real human and animal calibers and we'll come on to that um shortly but the opportunities within the area of models and mannequins i think for both anatomy and 
clinical skills and surgery are now so great. We have amazing tools to say nothing about the, the software and the virtual reality and um, AI tools as well that can really sort of bring many, many different um, uh, um, opportunities to the learning process um, through, through technology. Here you can see uh, two more of the Sindhava human models. Um, the, on the left, you can see the, uh, the vasculature and the nerves being um, uh, finalized within this body. And on the right, you have a military model with the um, skin layer and a large wound in the, um, the abdomen. So we have also that area of training within the military field for which both human and animal um, mannequins can really sort of help provide not only a more a fully ethical solution, um, but also a better opportunity. Because when you have the models and the mannequins, of course, you have that opportunity for repetition, the opportunity for students and trainees to practice a technique um, um, and to, to repeat it, to continue until they and their teachers feel there is mastery there. So competence and confidence um, at a certain stage, and we will, of course, be looking at uh, a range of different te teaching objectives, a set different sets of teaching objectives according to the the, the um, different educational levels. Um, and typically, trainees, students, and trainees will be working on more low fidelity basic models at first, because within clinical skills and surgery, for example where the very beginning will be how to hold an, a needle and a needle driver, um, looking at sort of eye-hand coordination, um, muscle memory, and so on. Um, and it is said that to learn a skill wrong, you only need to practice 50 times, but to learn it correctly, you need 200 times. So it's important, I think, to recognize just, just the value of performing skills correctly, basic skills correctly from the very start or beginning to learn them from the very start and mastering them before going on to the next level, because each of those skill sets will lead on to the next uh, skill set, um, after which mastering that skill set can be achieved. And only then can you go on to the next level. So we're dealing with a com potential complexity, a greater levels of fidelity of the tools from basic silicone pad to a multi-layered silicone pad, to an isolated organ, for example, um, onto uh, an isolate an organ within an organ system in a whole body mannequin, um, and then after that, working within the clinic, being apprenticed into observing, assisting, and performing minor procedures and then more advanced procedures, and that's true for veterinary medicine and um, and human medicine. Of course, the the clinical learning opportunities with patients is a, a very important area where the living animal is or the living human um, is being uh, approached and, and worked with. Um, so that's a healing environment, not a not a harming environment, but it's very important that the students and trainees have got to the right level on non-animal and some other methods first before they work with the patients. They, you can't put any patient's uh, well-being or lives at risk. Um, so it's very important to use other methods first and only when there really is com confidence and competence to go on to working with the, uh, the patients and then uh, graduating into, into um, more professional activity. We also uh, have, of course, a range of different tools. Um, I've taken these two shots from our forthcoming veterinary film um, because I was there filming and I was um, looking at everything. So uh, this isn't about human medicine, but the tools are very, very similar. This is the Sindhava canine and the company also makes, of course, the human models, as you've seen just now. So here you can see a practical class with enterotomy, uh, resection and anastomosis being done. You can see the uh, um, anastomosis on the right hand side and the broader picture with this station um, of um, what with one of the Sindhava canines and two students and the uh, the uh, the teacher there um, on the left hand side. Um, and of course, what's really important about this, I think, is is that 
it's a non-stressful environment. It's a very good learning environment. It might even be fun in some ways, but the students, the trainees get the opportunity to keep on practicing until they've got to the uh, the stage of uh, confidence and competence for each of these um, different procedures. Um, and also, in some ways, it's a simpler environment. You haven't got the stress of uh, uh, an animal experiment, knowing that you're taking a life, um, that uh, it might be it would be a life that's taken unnecessarily when we consider the different uh, tools that exist um, and the different approaches that can, could bring about that replacement. Um, and you've also got a, an education that's more accessible. You haven't got the um, the coercion, the the bullying, the discomfort that some students might have um, within uh, a lab that involves harmful animal use. So um, you've got an education that's accessible to everyone with their different religious and moral perspectives um, um, and people who are critical thinking enough to know that there are other better ways of doing things. Um, also within the uh, uh, issue of um, looking at models and mannequins, of course, we have situations where a whole simulated clinics can be set up. Um, when I was at Cornell University filming that Sindava lab um, just now, um, we also went into a, a simulated clinic where um, the uh, um, applied pharmacology class was happening. And they have case studies um, with real patients and a mannequin where um, an emergency situation is, is presented um, or a, um, a pathology is there, and the students, a number of students are in there with the simulated dog in this simulated clinic in, environment. The other students are in the next room observing what those students are doing in a non-pressuring way. Um, and then the two students who've performed the, uh, the procedure or, or um, given the appropriate medicine according to the condition that the animal is uh, is suffering from, which they have to, of course, decide on as well, um, everyone then gets together and discusses the process. So it's a very fair and um, equal and collaborative environment um, within a, a safe simulated situation where a lot of different opportunities concerning different conditions are being presented. Um, and here on the, in the photograph on the left hand side, of course, you have a, a patient where um, a number of different uh, procedures and treatment approaches can be used um, within human medicine. On the right hand side, this was a, um, a an international world urology conference where I was um, at and filming the use of this simulator for laparoscopic surgical training. Again, this was human medicine. Um, and um, the tool that you can see there is the POP trainer, the pulsating organ perfusion trainer produced by Optimist, um, the company in Austria. And this is a simulator that's a closed and clean system where trainees can be practicing a range of different laparoscopic techniques with different tools, sometimes new tools, um, and again, can do so within a, a safe and ethical environment. This tool does use waste slaughterhouse material, which wouldn't fit into our policy, but ethically sourced animal cadavers and viscera could indeed still be used. And when we organized a couple of brief training sessions with the POP trainer, um, we did manage to get ethically sourced um, um, animal material to use within, within the, uh, the, the trainer. Over the next year or two, perhaps, really advanced 3D pr printing or 3D bioprinting, um, I'm sure will develop sufficiently for reflecting the, the, the details and the layering within the vasculature for advanced laparoscopic training with this tool um, using um, home produced or university produced tools as well. Multimedia is the next uh, area of um, um, non-animal tool. And I've alluded to this before, mentioned a little bit about it. On the left, we can see um, a, uh, an online dissection or rather a virtual dissection. Many softwares are also live online as well and linked to the server of the, uh, the producing university or company. Um, but of course, many have been on CD as well. And on the left, you can see a rat dissection where you can easily um, click on different buttons in order to look at the different organs and organ systems to get information about them, to look at different magnifications, to compare between species, because comparative anatomy is very important and software can really, I think, give an extra tool in terms of being able to switch between species and magnifications um, 
uh, as well as different parts of the body um, as well. On the right, you can see a more sort of um, uh, a different sort of approach that doesn't simulate dissection. We don't always have to just copy the uh, um, the standard conventional approaches. We can also use approaches where you can dissolve away different layers of the animal body. So in this case, you can dissolve away the, the skin, you can get to the first layer of muscles and the second layer, and you can go deeper into different organ systems. You can click and choose between organ systems and look at those in relation to other systems, look at one organ in relation to another organ um, and how it relates to the vasculature, the nerves, the skeleton, and so on. Um, and of course, with software like this, you can, you can spend a lot of time as a student investigating it. You can often do this in your own time, um, you can often do it in your own home. Um, and I think that gives an extra bit of flexibility that goes beyond frog dissection in the lab, which, of course, is time limited um, and limited in many other ways as well. When you can work at your own pace, you can be more self-directed. I think you can also help guarantee that you've understood certain principles, that you've understood um, and gain the knowledge more effectively. So you've got an element there of sort of self-training and self-monitoring. And of course, this sort of software often has multiple choice questions and opportunities um, for you to, to revise both as you're doing the lab and afterwards and in advance of an exam too. Um, some of the online um, methods, and uh, I think we have next uh, some images of uh, Sim Muscle. Um, so this is a virtual laboratory where you can do an online um, lab just like you would do with the animal experiment, an isolated frog muscle. So this is a direct copy, um, but perhaps is good for teaching the principles within muscle physiology. With, when this is online, and it has been available, of course, on CD in the past, um, the teachers themselves can monitor um, um, during or after the, the work by the students, how the students are performing. Um, and I think that's very, very important that the teachers will be able to catch out any student who might be using another person's results. Um, it might be the teacher can also uh, look at where mistakes can be made. So you've got a much more sort of um, interactive program, not just within the program itself of having a virtual lab with its multiple uh, apparatus and, and following through the whole experiment, but also between student and teacher as well. The fact that the, the students can be so self-directed, I think is very, very important. Um, Dr. Hans Brown from University Institute of Physiology at Marburg University in Germany, who developed Sim Muscle amongst other um, programs within the virtual physiology series. And we filmed an interview with Dr. Brown and his colleague, um, who've uh, worked on a number of different programs. Um, um, what I think they find so valuable is that is that it really frees up the students and the teachers to be um, more effective in the learning and teaching. So um, the students, Dr. Brown would say, are more self-directed. They learn by doing, learn through doing. So it's a very effective way of being much more engaged with the, the programme um, rather than watching or being one part of a, um, an animal experiment where a preparation such as the frog muscle or frog nerve or um, frog heart are being used to illustrate physiological and pharmacological principles. This software is, is quite, there are lots of the physiological aspects of pharmacology taught within the, the series too. Um, and there's also an element of randomness as well. So um, both within um, Sim Neuron, but also within Sim Muscle and Sim Nerve and the other programs, um, the an algorithm can generate the results. And sometimes, of course, that means that the uh, the neuron or the, the muscle doesn't work because this is what happens in real life. So um, there's occasionally uh, um, problems that arise. You need to you need to solve. Um, there's there's variability between um, each time you click go and. Uh, um, and stimulate the muscle or the nerve. Um, and uh, there's also that opportunity for teachers to see what the students have done um, and to monitor them as well. So you have the opportunity with software to go back and forth between um, different parts of the program to help you as a student or trainee uh, make sure you've really understood things. So I think it's much more flexible 
Um, and being able to work at your own rate makes it also more accessible for the different um, entry points that students students might have in terms of their skills and their understanding um, of this process. And the looking stepping back and looking at the different range of tools that um, uh, exist, having that diversity of tools, not just software or models and uh, um, and so on, but um, but real animals, as we'll talk about shortly as well, I think also means that different learning um, methods that that individuals may have, because we're all different and we all learn in very different ways, sometimes more experientially, sometimes more visually and so on, can also be accommodated um, better. So again, education can be more accessible um, as a result of using um tools of this nature um there are also animations of course this is just a clip of a uh um, equine anatomy um, and and uh um, internal medicine um software but uh, i put this in because it gives you a chance this particular software gives you a chance to understand not just anatomy and to be able to turn the uh the animal body round um, and over and to look through at different magnifications and do fly throughs. Um, but it also gives you the chance to understand the development of different conditions, the twisting of a certain organ, for example, so that you, you have a much um, improved opportunity to visually understand if that's your way of learning. Um, and everyone learns visually to some degree, of course, um, the development of a certain condition and therefore how to treat it. So this is important for human medicine and also for veterinary. Um, but I think um, it, there's also an element here where um, zoologists can learn a lot. Here you have an app um, for your, your revision before an operation. This is a uh, there are various um, phone apps where you can look at specific procedures and remind yourself as well. So you have that sort of uh, on-demand option um, for revision and um, exploring certain procedures that um, software can produce as well. Um, then, of course, we get to much more immersive and advanced software. All the different softwares I've talked about, the virtual dissection, the virtual anatomy program that isn't dissection, but it's still anatomy, the virtual laboratory, which is more interactive, um, are all valuable for specific purposes and specific levels um, of education and skill sets um, or and, and areas of knowledge that need to be understood and gained. But at the more advanced level, then, of course, virtual reality, um, more advanced technology level, virtual reality is very, very important. Um, not only do you have the chance to uh, perhaps understand anatomy in a very immersive and um, uh, sensory way, but you also have the chance to get involved in some clinical skills and surgery practice as well. Sometimes it might be working um, with goggles like this image. Other times it might be working more in a sort of large platform in a room. Um, but certainly um, um, uh, augmented reality, AR and virtual reality, VR, um, are very, very important and can be combined with other approaches very well um, in order to understand structure and and um, various uh, processes within clinical skills and surgery too. Now, what happens when you really need hands-on experience of animals and animal tissue? Now, virtual reality, of course, can be hands-on. The, the uh, haptic technology, which is the simulation of the sense of touch, is a hands-on uh, quality that is available within some virtual reality models. But it's not necessary for all. You may not need the sense of touch, but it's certainly there. M moving back from, um, <clears throat> excuse me, moving back from um, high-tech methods and software methods, of course, there is the hands-on um, with real animals and, uh, and humans as well. And this is where we talk about ethically sourced cadavers, organs, and tissues. And human body donation programs have existed for a very long time. Of course, they started off with some, uh, um, some problems with grave robbing. Um, that wasn't really a donation program. That was more a question of uh, theft um, and disrespect for the, uh, for the cadaver, for the person. Um, but there are now, of course, well-established body donation programs, not enough bodies for human medicine, for sure, but um, 
Um, this is an area where, where human bodies can be provided for certain important uses within um, education and training, and also body donation programs, of course, within veterinary medicine too. Um, within our policy, we also talk about um, acceptable other sources, which is a, um, a slight flexibility within our policy for where um, ethically sourced, according to the definition, is not quite um, possible. Um, so uh, I will leave you to check the policy for, for that area. Um, and you can find that at interniche.org. So body donation programs are really important, I think, to provide animal and human cadavers, which can be useful within the range of different tools and approaches for um, knowledge and skills acquisition. But there's also, of course, some very good um, software, the anatomage table, um, other software, including many online and free um, uh, programs that you can find, which can be used in combination. Organs, human and animal, can also be preserved. So plastination is a particular uh, approach, of course, that is used for preserving um, organs. And um, there's also a, a, a relatively cheaper version um, produced by Dr. Fozzi El Nadi from Egypt, now in the US, um, called the El Nadi Method. Um, and this uses some of the same um, steps as plastination, but it is uh, low cost um, and also produces models that are, are often more flexible. So it can be used not just for anatomy lessons to produce a, a near permanent model um, that will last decades within a, a university in a, um, a university museum um, or, or, or anatomy lab, but also models that can be used within some clinical skills and surgery as well. So preservation is also important. Um, and then you can also perfuse and pulsate organs. So the POP trainer that I talked about earlier with the photograph from the urology conference, which was a, um, a training event with about 10 of the, tr of the POP trainers set up and Tr surgical trainees from across the world training in different laparoscopic techniques with different tools um, as a standard training event within the conference. It wasn't seen as an alternative at all. It was just a good and better training tool. Um, the photograph on the right here is also um, at an event that we held, a conference, an international conference we held in Oslo in Norway. Um, and here you can see um, one of the uh, conference delegates practicing her laparoscopic techniques on the uh, the organ inside. So both um, the the pop trainer and also um, Abud's method, produced by uh, developed by Dr. Emad Abud, a Syrian American neurosurgeon, use the perfusion and pulsate perfusion of animal or human um, organs or organ systems, um, and adding pulsation in order to simulate. Um, the circulation of blood um, and to provide the challenges um, required for um, managing bleeding, which of course is so important within uh, clinical skills, but especially surgery. So this method here, you can see this is from filming that we did um, in um, in Arkansas with um, Professor Abut. Um, and uh, here he's working on a real donated human head for practicing neurosurgery. Um, so again, it's, it's, there's pulsation, there's perfusion, um, and every trainee gets the opportunity to, uh, to practice and practice and practice again until they're ready to go on to the next stage. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities there, I think, for creating a, a, a live surgical experience um, with a, uh, an animated cadaver um, uh, that goes beyond uh, a standard cadaver and its use. There's also clinical work with patients, of course, uh, with animal patients, with human patients. After students and trainees have worked with the non-animal and a few other methods um, that are all um, non-harmful, um, of course, working in the clinic as an apprentice is, is absolutely crucial. It's realistic, it's case-based, it's experiential. So it's completely realistic and it is the, the the situation within the clinic, within the operating room. And so I think it's extremely valuable. And the more that students and trainees have the opportunity to have that hands-on experience, um, the better. Perhaps 
education and training could begin a little bit earlier, especially within veterinary medicine. Um, we could also consider that for, for human medicine as well. More opportunities to work with and observe, even recorded, um, procedures within the the uh, and the clinic, within the operating theatre. Um, and I think this is uh, a crucial area. Within veterinary, we can say that there's lots of opportunities for within neutering tech, neutering uh, um uh, clinics and mobile veterinary clinics and so on, where a lot of experience can be got. Within human medicine, there are a lot of clinics, a lot of hospitals. And I think the more that students can be apprenticed within that uh, area, the better. And such work can also be a replacement for animal experimentation for certain procedures. So clinics are important. And what they also teach beyond the procedural, the technical aspect, are is I think the clinical skill we can call caring. Caring is a clinical skill. It's easy just to think about your hands, uh, your eye-hand coordination, but caring is a clinical skill as well. I think it's essential if we lose uh, the skill of caring, of empathy, of understanding, then we lose a lot of qualities that are so important for the medical and the veterinary doctor. Um, and I think you're going to be more able to look at animal welfare, to look at human behavior, to communicate with the patient um, by observing and also through, through uh, discussion in order to make a more accurate diagnosis um, and therefore to choose better treatment. And you're more going to be more interested in following up in um in the developments in a certain field of, uh, of disease, of, in con of condition um, and of treatment. So I think caring has its uh, um, many different areas where you can you can practice that um, and many different areas where um, its impact can be observed. Um, certainly, alternative tools and approaches can validate this if you're using non-animal methods, that's already one important validation. You're not harming an animal in the process. You're not risking desensitization of yourself um, by uh, doing what is basically a hardening of your um, of your emotions, of, of limiting and losing some of your emotional literacy concerning compassion and empathy and ability to communicate and respect, I think, for the patient as well. Um, so, so the alternatives already, I think, encourage that. But also working in the clinic um, itself can also allow you to explore that further and to develop it, not just to avoid losing some, some skills and qualities you have with your emotional literacy, but also to develop it further. Um, and that also includes working even with the non-animal methods. So when you work in a situation with a non-animal method within uh, trauma management, within a certain sort of crisis, a surgical crisis, you can learn in a very safe environment how to um, manage that emotion, such as panic um, and fear, in order to um, be more able to, do, to deal with it, to be able to step back from it temporarily temporary desensitization of yourself, not permanent desensitization, and then bring back your um, uh, your, um, your your caring as you've worked out how to actually focus them on the procedure um, and and manage the emotion. So I think that the, the sort of there's a balance to be found and there's a an interplay between um, clinical detachment, and emotional literacy, including caring for the patient and making sure they have the best treatment. Um, and simulated clinics and, and working with mannequins can help um, expose students to such um, an area and to such a uh, an environment where that skill in itself can be learned more effectively. So um, both non-animal methods and the clinic itself can help in the training of a um, of a, vet, a veterinary and a medical doctor, we can also do self experimentation. So not uh, a an active um, uh, um, work that's uh, that's invasive on yourself, but something very basic. This is typically done within medicine, but also within zoology classes um, as well. Um, when you're looking at sort of uh, basic um, physiology, so you can do a simple um, nerve conduction velocity experiment on yourself. Um, it goes through the ethics committee of the university. You attach two electrodes, give yourself a minor, minor electric shock, 
between your elbow and your wrist, and you look at the evoked nerve response, um, and you can analyze that. And that's exactly the same as the, the preparation with the um, isolated frog nerve. And you can do muscle physiology, you can do exercise physiology, respiratory physiology, you can do some pharmacology work with drinking coffee, with urine analysis, and so on. And of course, there are some ethical issues to address with this concerning confidentiality and uh, and permission and so on. But this is typically done within many medical classes and can be um, enhanced further and, and uh, broadened to cover more labs and also to bring about replacement of any remaining animal experimentation uh, and preparations that might use frog nerve or muscle or, or um, heart and so on. So you can do basic experiments with software and hardware. And I think within physiology, a combination of this and something like sim nerve or sim muscle that I showed the virtual lab stills image from earlier are really excellent. You can do understand all try to understand all the basic knowledge of nerve and muscle physiology first using the software. Then you can apply it on yourself, apply that knowledge to yourself. And working, of course, by yourself and in a team with your students is more fun. And it brings you, especially as a medical student, um, but also to others, back to, to working with the real human body on yourself, which is very important for medical students to remember they're dealing with humans, um, but also for anyone, because we're talking about vertebrates. Um, then I think um, those a combination of software and models and student labs can really help um, with understanding and, and also having a fun experience. The number of students and trainees who might be put off biology or medicine or veterinary medicine because of the harmful animal use they might not even have entered into the class, into the faculty, um, or they might just want to leave it. Um, and having a negative um, experience of um, those faculties is a real shame because those are critical thinking people who care. And they're exactly the sort of people we need within uh, the life sciences and within medicine. In vitro labs, penultimately, um, this is um, um this is a, a cell and we can look at mitochondria where um, a typical biochemistry experiment can be done using mitochondria sourced from vegetables from turnips uh, are one of the best i understand um instead of from rat liver so cell respiration experiments um looking at this you can also work with um even plant material which can be a direct replacement too and that material of course could also be ethically sourced animal or human tissue but I think um, you can bring about replacement of any killing or experiments of the animal, sometimes even with plant material. And getting used to in vitro labs is also very important for preparing those students who might want to go on into humane research and testing, because a lot of that work will be in vitro too. And finally, ethical field studies. So getting out of the lab, getting into the field, wildlife biology, observational work, um, I think can be very, very valuable, especially for biologists, for zoologists, um, but also for some other, other areas as well. And I think it's, it's important to be able to recognize that um, within a culture or within science, where often things are taken apart into their component parts, their constituent parts, it's important to remember we have systems, we have whole bodies, we have subjects. And that's really um uh, important, I think, to, to recognize that we can uh, um, learn a lot with living animals and animals within their ecological context. So that's covered the area of types of alternatives. I'm aware we don't have uh, so much time, so I will go faster through the next uh, um, next few slides, and then we can get to the, the, the questions um, that um, the cat can present to to me and to us shortly. Another myth that's important is that um, I think to recognize that students, some people think that if you don't have animal experiments uh, and you have any alternatives, you don't have hands-on experience of animals and animal tissue. But I think that what I've talked about, the ethically sourced cannabis, the, uh, um, the ethical field studies and the clinical learning opportunities show that that's really not the case. So Within medicine, of course, we have to ask, well, is it relevant for medical students to have experience of animals? And in almost all cases, I think we can say, no, I want my doctor to be experienced with humans, not with frogs. Um, so relevance is very important there. 
And of course, replacements can even involve animals for when you really do want that hands-on experience. When we reflect on what the teaching objectives are, I think we can see that according to the studies and a lot of feedback from teachers and students is that the standard teaching objectives can be met more effectively with the alternatives. When courses are audited and the teaching objectives are identified and the methods chosen to meet those objectives more effectively are looked into, we can see that standard objectives can be met more effectively. Also, class sizes can be managed more easily and so on. We can acquire knowledge and skills and attitude in, attitudes in a better way. The published studies illustrate this, including the uh, systematic reviews. And we can also meet new objectives. What can curricular redesign and the use of innovative technologies add to the education process? We can master new surgeries that we couldn't do before, for example, and we can develop caring as clinical skill. And we can also overcome what's called the hidden curriculum. These are the implicit lessons and messages that are often negative that may or may not be um, um, understood um, or engaged with by the teachers, but which students will certainly experience. That could include habituating the student into instrumental use of animals, facilitating desensitization and teaching conformity. And alternatives can obviate or remove that negative hidden curriculum. If we talk about life science philosophy, biology is the study of life. So it's very important, I think, not to be working all the time with cadavers and killing. Um, let's focus on life. Similarly, medicine and veterinary medicine is a healing art and science. It's inconsistent, it's counterintuitive to be working within a, an environment that is harming. I don't think that's a good way of learning medicine and veterinary medicine, particularly when there are so many good alternatives that are demonstrated to be superior. Critical thinking is really important. It's, a, it's a, an essential skill. When teachers themselves think critically about the courses and think about the best way to meet teaching objectives, they're demonstrating their own critical thinking, and that's a lesson in itself. But also the software, the, the other approaches that are the alternatives can also further encourage that critical thinking, that problem solving, that appreciation of the importance of understanding a principle before you go on to the next stage. So critical thinking is also supported through the use of well-designed tools, which of course are mostly developed by the teachers themselves to enhance their own courses and then marketed more widely. Emotional literacy can also be uh, not just um, uh, protected, but can be enhanced sensitivity, respect for life and compassion and empathy, as well as emotional competence. Um, we don't want to stunt the emotional literacy. And there's a lot of opportunities here, I think, for personal and professional growth by recognizing um, the value of emotional literacy, that skill, that personal and social skill. Ethically, of course, I think it's very important to have an ethically rooted uh, degree to be ethically competent and have a sense of responsibility. There's a lot of unethical practice within the world. Let's not add to it. Let's uh, work against it and support the growth of these uh, um, positive qualities and skills. And this is really important, I think, for all the professions. Um, it's also important, I think, to be able to identify and find solutions to ethical challenges. Finally, there's an ongoing opportunity there for growing personally and professionally. You can ensure that education is more accessible and, and inclusive, as I mentioned before, in terms of religious and moral positions. And I think that's very important to be inclusive, as well as different learning approaches that a range of tools can help um, accommodate. It's also a matter of freedom of conscience and civil liberties. There are civil rights and human rights issues um, at stake here as well. Um, and when you're using only alternatives, of course, you don't have those problems. And it's much better to be, have a situation where you can focus on what you're really trying to learn and gain rather than dealing with complications like um, people being bullied off their course or coerced into do using animals in a harmful way. And that also, I think, reflects very strongly within the, uh, um, the personal and institutional reputations. Um, Tufts University in the US set up a body donation program for animals in their veterinary class. And that 
attracted people specifically to that university. Similarly, universities that use really advanced mannequins, where clearly the teachers are really, really care about the quality of the education and meeting standard and additional teaching objectives very effectively. Animal freedom, if animals are not used, of course, uh, then the animals are free. Either they're not being bred or not being caught, um, they're certainly not being harmed and killed. Ecologically, there's a, there's a positive environmental aspect. It's not 100% ecological. Um, software still needs to be produced, electricity produced, but there are a lot of very positive ecological impacts from using alternatives too. And of course, in terms of society, you're going to have better trained biologists and doctors and vets, and that has an impact across all of the history of the profession and the, the breadth of the profession within society too. And often you can bring about positive economic benefits. Some alternatives are free, some are very low cost, others can be very expensive. There's a wide range there, um, and often um, money can be saved by using the alternatives. And even if things are more expensive, then certainly the investment will um, bring about um, a lot of very positive uh, returns as well. You can also produce your own tools too and sell them. That's also very important, I think, for universities to recognise. And finally, legislation. Replacement alternatives should be used wherever possible. And that has been demonstrated in departments across the world. So I think it's much more in accordance with, with uh, legislation um, and where harmful animal use continue, continues in the minority of places, I think we possibly can say now, then um, we have to ask, is this in accordance with national legislation or European, for example, directives? To finish off with the resources, sorry about the time, we have information resources, our last book and a new book to come, our forthcoming documentary and innovations within veterinary medicine, but also the clinic, the uh, medical clips um, concerning um, the physiology software and the neurosurgical training and a case studies book across biology, medicine and veterinary, um, which um, we're working on this year and next year. And uh, we're also looking for contributors. So do make contact if you have a, an interesting um, humane education tradition or humane innovation. And our website, you can see our website, our database is there. This is our alternatives database with about 1,500 entries, individual information for specific products, the studies database with relevant studies concerning the issue, and uh, with references too. And there's also PDFs available if you contact me directly. We have libraries of, uh, of tools that you can borrow, international, Canadian, uh, Kenyan, Indian, and more. Mexican. We have occasionally small grants that we can give out and some freeware. We support students who conscientiously object to harmful animal use. And we're involved, of course, in conferences, seminars such as this one, outreach tours and training. Um, there's also a lot of other resources available you can find online. Students have free access to the virtual physiology series I was talking about earlier at this site. There's also other information resources such as Norena, and you can also make your own materials and link across disciplines to get inspiration. You can also look for funding through uh, the Lush Prize for projects that have been very successful. Um, and a lot of money has been given out by Lush for, uh, in order to support, to, to reward people who've done some really good work within education, training, and also research and testing. So to conclude, we believe that alternatives are superior to harmful animal use in terms of knowledge and skills and attitude acquisition um, and can often help achieve a lot more. 100% replacement of harmful animal use is possible. There's a diverse range of um, tools and approaches with alternatives for every practical class. And you can see by looking at the databases what these are. And there's a growing momentum and success for replacement such that alternatives are now often considered the norm by many teachers who developed and or implemented them. So really it's a win-win situation, multiple positive impact um, with students able to access better quality tools to gain knowledge and skills more effectively, 
um, teachers able to pass on their knowledge and skills more effectively too, and to work with better uh, a range of different tools and 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 increasing class sizes as well as other challenges. Um, the animals, of course, winning by not being killed or harmed anymore, um, or having student involvement as within clinics um, to actually benefit from their role within education and then the professions of course because better trained students and trainees will enter into them more critical thinking more emotionally and ethically literate and more responsible and that's very very important in a growth of a more ethical um profession and and range of professions and of course that impacts more widely on society too so thank you very much for listening and uh, apologies for going a little bit over the time in terms of uh, the presentation. And I'm very uh, happy to uh, um, uh, stay for uh, some time, including some extra time for any questions now. Thank you very much, Nick. This was wonderful. Um, and we have uh, some questions as well. Um, so I will start maybe with one um, that wasn't, I think everybody's interested in. What is your experience worldwide um, in terms of um, legislation, are there still countries where you are approached a lot by students who don't want to do harmful um, yeah, animal experiments during their studies? Um, what is the tendency? What have you seen over the last decades? Yes, I, I think there was a lot of conscientious objections some years ago and, and things sort of dropped off a little bit, probably because there was such uh, a wide range of implementation of, of um, good soft good software and other alternatives um, um, and also maybe there's maybe there was a, a greater degree of conformity that sort of has developed in recent years it's difficult to say really um, sometimes also there's a, a difference between the sexes as well sometimes it's more women who might be objecting other times it seems to be men so it's very difficult to say I'd say that certainly there seems to be a situation where there's always a lot more discomfort with harmful animal use than is immediately visible. There's often a very small minority of people who are willing to really stand up um, and consci conscientiously object publicly um, and challenge the university. Because of course, you know, everyone's in the university is that they're young, they, they're, they're new, they don't know what to expect. Um, and they, to some degree, are intimidated by the knowledge and the, the, uh, the power of the teachers. So it's a very difficult situation, really, for students to, uh, to object. But There are resources available, including on our website, on how to potentially go about this. Um, and recently there's been um, successful mass conscientious objection um, in Strasbourg, um, in France, and, um, and that's also sort of brought about some positive change. There's a current situation in, in uh, um, Barcelona with students conscientiously objecting as well. So sometimes it takes just one student to actually stand up and bring others with them. Um, but certainly the the number of active conscientious objectors does not sort of um, um, is not always reflected in the, the number of people uh, who might be feeling discomfort. Um, so very, very difficult to say. Conscientious objection is certainly defended in the Ita in Italian laws, but there are also a lot of Italian laws and lots of laws are not implemented properly. Um, and um, but at the same time, conscientious objection and deeply held moral beliefs, including veganism, are usually reflected in human rights legislation. Um, so I think that's um, an area where sort of broader human rights legislation is also relevant from the right up from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to sort of national laws. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, Otherwise, legislation says alternatives should be used wherever possible, and that's a very important area. That's why also case studies are really important, both for our veterinary film, the medical clips we'll be producing over the year, um, and also the, the wide range of tools you can see in the alternatives database or that have been written about in the studies database, which are also case studies in themselves where these things exist and have been used. So I think it's important to recognize that These are normal ways of doing things in many places um, and to, to learn from that as well. Yeah. So do you also offer train the trainer workshops? Because I think this is the big problem. I, I just remember from my time um, at university that, you know, some professors were very sure that their method was the only one. And yeah, I could only really go against them when I became an inspector and then challenge them 
you know, as an inspector, but it's kind of frustrating. It must, and it desensitizes students. I mean, that's something there's, there's a lot of um, papers on that, how it really, and you mentioned that as well, you know, so I, is there any way of training the trainers or is that something that you leave to the providers of the different um, methods and models um, that, that you that we promote yes i think i think there's um i think some 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 models are just so basic that you just need a no training if you're going to be talking showing a um, a pig heart you can use the pig heart you can use the pig model you know it's, it's very simple the the teachers themselves the anatomists the physiologists they know how to teach uh in a certain way but they know, generally know the the anatomy and the physiology principles so using a different tool can sometimes be very very easy and that's why some um alternatives that are direct simulations of an animal experiment such as the sim muscle sim nerve i showed you earlier um can be very valuable because they can just bring about direct replacement very quickly because the same thing is being done you have the virtual frog heart or you um or you have the the real one and you've got the same apparatus but you've also got it slightly simplified so actually it's a bit of an advantage so sometimes it's very simple sometimes software and other models have their own wraparound support material for teachers and the teachers can have their own modules for for learning things when it comes to an advanced simulator for um say canine abdominal surgery or human abdominal surgery again it'll be the same procedures but you're working with a, a model which, well, in some cases, actually, it's going to be more realistic than the, the real human or animal body because you haven't got the uh, the change in texture and colour with the organs. Um, you've still got circulating synthetic blood um, and you, you avoid some of the complications. So, again, you're going to be doing the same procedure on a different model. So sometimes it's, a, it's very, very easy to bring about that replacement, um, I think, I think an opportunity for teachers to try out these tools are um, is is important, and that's one reason we have a we have our loan systems. Um, but of course, we, you know we don't we don't have the hundreds or thousands of different human and animal clinical skills and surgical models that would be nice to lend to people, nor the cost to send them. So sometimes teachers just have to talk to their own colleagues, maybe to go to events organised by the producers, which are organised go to academic conferences such as veterinary veterinary education surgical events and so on or biology events um and 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 get some experience in that way we do organize some training events events ourselves um and sometimes that involves bringing the teachers and the producers themselves to it otherwise the the film on veterinary veterinary uh, medicine that we're producing the clips on human medicine will also provide a lot of experience, I think, and some sort of demonstrations, at least, which is an element of the training process. Yeah, that is most wonderful because I think sometimes the the trainers or teachers need to be inspired, uh, but and it's not maybe if they don't come across the, this inspiration around in their immediate surrounding. You know, it's important to yeah. Get them yeah, I think borrowing them and trying them, buying, trying things out is really important, but also yeah. to understand that there are, there are myths there mm -hmm. and to understand that that need sort of subverting and or owning by those who subscribe to the myths and then subverting. Um, so it's a realization that we're talking about teaching objectives, not a certain method, which is the only way of doing things. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and also I think the chance to to, yeah certainly try things out, but recognize that there are broader pictures, broader objectives that can be can be met, negative lessons that harmful animal use sends you as well. So once you understand that more broadly and focus on the teaching objectives, I think um, the various different bricks in the wall that are stopping you seeing the other side have been gradually taken down. And then you can see, oh yes, actually there are better ways of doing things. And that of course is much more scientific it's looking at the evidence. What are you trying to achieve? What are the best methods? And, you know, a good scientist would also see that too. Um, another question um, that aims towards uh, sen being sensitive and um, caring is, are there established tools or techniques for affective training or sensibilization training? Well, the, the virtual clinics that you can have within veterinary and human medicine, um, 
I think are, are important because you have an opportunity and some universities have these clinics, of course, and have one to one communication with simulated patients who might be human or might be a model. Um, but people who will come in and you can actually practice your um, your uh, patient uh, communication, your customer care um, within within those clinical situations. So. Um, you have not only the technical aspects, but you have the communication aspects. And I think virtually all human medical courses have some of these now as well. Um, of course, they could be enlarged, they could be enhanced, they could be improved, as is always the case. I mean, education should be an evolving thing. Having things rigid and fixed is, like I say, unscientific and doesn't sort of look at the latest availability of tools, the latest educational theory. Uh, the latest best practice. So um, yeah, I think there's uh, a lot of a lot of opportunities there for you to practice sensitization. But certainly within biology, getting out into the field is another way of seeing the living animal that will sensitize you and avoid help avoid desensitization. Within veterinary and human medicine, you've got real patients, and you can practice that as well too. Um, yeah, I remember that I heard from from a friend who's a, a medical doctor. That she had one course, uh, like where they did the role plays, and that it was really awkward. And yeah, but obviously this is a very important skill for a physician <laughs> to know how to yeah be nice to the patient and deliver bad messages in the best possible way and things like that. So, but also to yeah, also to understand what the condition really might be. It might be that um, you've got a problem in your family. It might not be a you know that the sorting out the family relationship might be more important than yeah. than having medicine so you know being able to communicate well with with the patient I mean, okay you've got animal patients here as well but um there you're looking at needing to understand animal behavior better but also to talk to the family because the problem might still be within the family um but certainly being able to talk to the patient to be able to understand what the symptoms and the most important symptoms really are i think is is crucial too Another question, could um, a companion animal owner donate their animal's body for preservation and study while still respecting the past life of the animal? Yes, that's so that's really talking about sort of veterinary medicine, but there are also areas where we can look at animals that could be used within biology. So as well as software and model, non-animal models, we can look at animals that were maybe died in a pollution incident or died in a flood or or were, were found. And of course, we need to be thinking about um, biohazards as well. But and there are opportunities also for, for biologists too, but maybe more within veterinary medicine. Um, the, the Netherlands, for example, has a national level body donation program. Um, and um, that began more linking the animal protection group Proofdivrai with the University of Utrecht um, and as and um, within Utrecht and companion animal guardians or pet owners could choose to donate the body of their um, deceased companion animal into the program. And there was sufficient trust between the different all the different parties such that the companion animal guardians knew that the animal's bodies would be respected fully and would go into the education system to enhance the quality of education for those veterinary students who would then go on to be working with um, other dogs and cats and other animals, just like the animal that was deceased. Those bodies then can be used in some cases for fresh, um, fresh dissection. Um, they can be stored in a cool room, chill room for that purpose, and that's valuable. Um, But of course, combined with software and models, of course, that, that, that's just one method. But the organs and the bodies can then also be preserved using plastination or other methods. Um, and then those tools become um, uh, items that can be used for, for decades. There are an increasing number of body donation programs, some formal, some informal, where um, there's potential here for both replacement and enhancing the, the education. And those two things almost always go together anyway. But yeah, there are lots of opportunities there. I think that's an area where people can try to set things up. And there are sort of um, online available materials for you to sort of um, see um, what's all the different paperwork and so on, because it needs to be done 
totally above board and professionally and openly for it to work properly. Um, but there are informal ways of doing this too. Are there any statistics available on how many universities, for example, within the EU currently implement harmful animal use versus humane teaching methods in life science education? Well, countries that um, have uh, implemented the the directive with the European directive within on animal experiments within their national law, of course, have to write some uh, um, reports about the animal use. But that that reporting is not as good as it should be, um, and also the detail is not necessarily sufficient, depending on the country, um, in terms of knowing what exactly is happening or where it is. Um, also, animals that are killed in advance, such as animals killed for dissection and um, um, in most cases are not recorded. Um, and finally, you have a situation where permission for a procedure for a, an experiment within uh, education only needs to be applied for every five years. So you don't have a situation of knowing every year what's what's going on. Um, however, we're looking at roughly sort of 10% of animal use in general in terms of procedures might be in education. It might be a bit less in some places, it might be a bit more in others, but we're looking at about a tenth. But I mean, for me, it's a very important area, education, because it's it's what leads into everything else. All the professions come from a position of education. So the quality of the education is crucially important and it has a, a greater significance, I think, um, for that reason, or we we can consider the significance to be very great. Um, often it's the situation of each department being very different. There might be national and faculty-based tendencies or practices. Like I say, veterinary surgery generally in the UK is with patients and non-animal methods. In some countries, especially historically, it might have been a lot more with animal experiments. So there are some sort of national and cultural differences. But often it comes down to individual departments and the choice of an individual teacher as to what tool or approach is used within a certain practical class or training course, because it might be after graduation as well, of course, when some training continues. So certainly within Europe, I think it's a situation where, and also maybe North America, where an individual teacher can make the decision. So sometimes change happens one retirement at a time. Otherwise, now with everyone really very literate with computers, I think the power of technology is convincing a lot of people um, for both software um, alternatives, but also some good materials science alternatives too. Um, there's a few people who continue to want to do the same thing, um, but I think the focus on teaching objectives is a powerful way of trying to change that. But yeah, often it's individual places, things change over time. And if we had a huge team working every year on the situation, I think we would have a better picture of what the, the current situation is, a good snapshot. But I think a good Europe-wide survey that was very detailed, that was uh, uh, mandatory, would be a really good way of, of finding out exactly what the current situation is. Yeah, we had this one uh, large report uh, published in, until you know, the data from until 17 published in 19, um, but that wasn't, ex like it wouldn't tell you um, what exactly was done with the individual animals, like the, the, what were the educational programs. And uh, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I remember when, when I was assessing those, it was very interesting because if they were running, had been running for a while, you could always improve things. Like there was always something new, something you could use to pre-train before they did anything on the animal. It was always possible to to improve something. Mm -hmm. As you said, it's it's always evolving over time. So yeah. Um, so hopefully, yeah, it would be good to have more idea about this. And I think that's why we have to encourage, and that's why I'm happy to hear that students can contact you if they have issues and they want to object and they get support, because I think this is the best way also to get a better idea of where the problems are still. So. Yeah, that's right. And sometimes, you know, events and conscientious objection happen a lot in a certain place. Um, yeah. 
uh, in a certain time and, and you know trying to catch that moment and give people as much support as possible is really important um ultimately it comes down to the people saying to the students saying no but also saying yes to something you know most of these tools are really like so much better than the the harmful animal use that um, it's a very solution focused area um, and that's why i think like i say case studies is really important because if we can't say exactly what's happening across the world, we can certainly say, okay, this is happening in a hundred places and the the tools and approaches that were developed across these different national and cultural and economic backgrounds have all led to improvement of education and training. I think that's a very powerful way. So using examples, using case studies, but yeah, it will certainly, it will certainly also be good to know a little bit more or a lot more about what's going on in every department in each faculty and to be able to work to to introduce methods that that will actually help teachers and students um, to quite a large degree. Are there sets of resources made uh, in conversation with or considering the diverse realities in low and middle income countries? The film we're making um, has an episode that's just about complete and we're going to be launching it shortly. So uh, Keep an eye out for that. Um, that has the Sindhava K9, and that's about 20,000 euro or so for one, one model. It lasts decades and it has replaceable parts, but and it's certainly an investment, but it's expensive. However, there are a lot of free resources. A body donation program is free and make good use of resources. A lot of software is free. There are slideshows and materials online. There's often um, material available for trial or or for student use only. Like I said, the virtual physiology series is free for students. Faculties pay for it. Faculties can afford it more than uh, the students, but the students can get these free. So through our alternatives database, you can also um, look up um, and find a lot of free resources. And there's a lot of other material that's not in the database yet. Um, if you find something and it's not in there, please let us know but there is free material. So otherwise material is, it can be very, very low cost, $20, $30 for a, a, um, a CD, for example, that might give you 85 different physiology and pharmacology labs. You know, I mean, it's very cost effective. And of course you can use them almost indefinitely. Um, and animals used harmfully often, you know, cost money in most cases, the cost can go up and up and up. So you're saving money in some areas, you're spending money in others if it if it's not free already. So I think it's important to recognize that there are free resources, there are low cost resources. There's also the opportunity to develop tools yourself, which reflect your own curriculum, despite the fact that it's often common across the world, many curricula are common across the world, which is why such tools do have relevance across the world. But sometimes a specific animal might not be featured in some software and you could develop that yourself using an ethically sourced animal, doing a professionally performed dissection and filming it. And of course, maybe you could also sell that as well. So there are opportunities, I think, for low and middle income countries um, to make their own as well as to use low cost tools. And to remember that even the more expensive tools will bring about a good return in terms of the quality of training. Then there's another question about, you know, if you don't want to um, use animals in your studies, What, when is the best time to say to, to say that? Can students in pharma, pharmacy, veterinary, dental, and medical schools include their requests for non-animal educational alternatives either in their applications and or after matriculation, like after they enrolled or before they enroll in specific classes? What what is I mean? I guess it depends really on the country. But what is your general advice here? Um, yes, and just just very briefly to say uh, to, to the last question about income, and um, also there are tools already produced in many countries as well, Brazil, for example, or uh, uh, even even Egypt, so uh, and India. So sometimes you can find things already within your country. Coming back to when to to inquire or when to object, this is difficult to know really. I mean, some universities will be open about it um, on their websites. So when you're before you apply, you can find out what might be expected of you, or you can write and say, I would object to this, I'd like to use an alternative, and I'll see what their response is. Um, so sometimes you can find out in advance. Some people might argue that it's that you can be more effective by 
going to the faculty and trying to change things if you face harmful animal use there rather than find out that there is harmful animal use and get rejected or decide you want to go somewhere else. So it depends on maybe on what you want to achieve um, and whether you're willing to, to object. But I think a lot of, you also need to look at individual departments, which might be a bit tricky. Not everyone knows what's going on in every department. So certainly when you get to the university, you can try to find out, talk to the course leaders, um, talk to the head of department, be willing to go above them, appropriately if necessary after you've tried with the right level rather than going right above someone from the beginning um, and then try to do things if if nothing wor is works of course then you have all the sort of processes within conscientious objection that might be appropriate to um to follow from uh from legal threats to threats about to go to the media um but there's also a lot of possibility i think with um, working collaboratively with the teachers. And if you write your own proposal about what you think the alternatives could be, if the teachers are not informed and don't want to be informed about it, you could argue very well in terms of the published studies um, and have the chance to uh, um, to argue your case. And I think that's also quite a good um, educational experience, even if it might be a challenge. Um, and of course, get together with other people. There's always power with them um, in a group. You can do a lot by yourself. Often it's an individual who started something, whether it's Tufts body donation program started by one female student um, or you know a revolution. But when you get together, when you build up your, your alliances, when you find teachers that support you and you can link out with teachers in other universities, other faculties who've already developed and implemented these tools, I think you can sort of build up your power and your arguments, and that can be very effective too.